In the late 18th and early 19th century, the world was going through a great deal of change. In Great Britain, the Industrial Revolution was beginning, which was the largest change with how people lived since the Neolithic times. The American Revolution was happening in 1776 and the French Revolution in 1789. We're going to begin our focus on Europe here and talking about neoclassicism. This neoclassical piece by Jacques-Louis David emulated a great sense of calm and reason and really looked back to the Greek and Roman stories and sensibilities for its perspective. The subject matter here is is a father blessing his sons and offering um, protection to his sons. This is the Horiati boys, three of them on the left, and on the right-hand side are the women of the Horiati family. The Horiati boys were feuding with a family called the Curiati family. They were from a city called Alba Longana, also in Italy. And this moment, this stirring moment, is supposed to remind us of the... Um, the purpose of self-sacrifice, of giving oneself over to a greater good. So the story goes, the three Horiati brothers fight the three Curiati brothers. Only one of the brothers survives uh, from the, the Horiati family. The Curiati brothers are all killed. So one of these three brothers we're seeing here survives. On the right-hand side, these women in a swoon are not only fearful and upset that their husbands are going off to battle to meet these three young boys to do battle, but they are one of the girls is engaged, one of the boys shown here is married to one of the Curiati women. It's really the early Romeo and Juliet story we're seeing here, where the families are intermarried but have a great and very long-standing feud between them. It's important to mention that David, whose work we just saw, The Oath of the Horiati, he was a court painter for King Louis. And this, uh, this piece here, this is Elizabeth Vigie Lebron, she was also a court painter for King Louis, and he painted his wife, Marie Antoinette. And here Marie Antoinette is shown arranging flowers in a very simple country bonnet. And this was actually considered quite ludicrous, queen being shown in simple dress. And this was upsetting to the everyday people because as the rich were getting richer, the poor were getting poorer. And they saw the queen being displayed this way as throwing it in their face, trying to compare, the queen was trying to compare her humble beginnings to the life of the everyday person living on the street in France. So Elizabeth Vigie tried to do a portrait again of the queen. Here she is, Mary Antoinette and her children, from a few years later, right at the beginning of the French Revolution. So she's shown, Mary Antoinette, shown seated with her feet on a cushion, of course wearing a very royal robe rather than a country bonnet, a big plumed hat. She's shown with three children, and you notice the boy on the right is gesturing to an empty cradle that's showing the loss of her fourth child, a boy that had just passed on. If you look in the background on the left, there's a curtained room with the room peeking through, and that is the Hall of Mirrors that we saw in the Palace of Versailles last week. Her being displayed here as a devoted mother helps us to see her as someone whose place is in the home, not someone that's meddling in politics or trying to charm people. And she was thought of as being very flirtatious, and that was one of the reasons that um, that first image of her with the straw hat, that very casual image, was also seen as being quite lewd. By 1789, things in France had reached a boiling point. The French Revolution was the people's answer to the financial disaster that France had been teetering on for quite a while. One of the things they blamed was the queen, who we just saw, Mary Antoinette, and her extravagant uh, taste and personal vices. Neoclassicism, neoclassicism really became the hallmark language of the French Revolution. We have here shown Marat. He was a uh, leader in the French Revolution. He was someone who was really responsible for deciding who lived and who died. So the common people overthrew the French government. And of the many people that were put to death, 
at the guillotine, which was a very new invention at the time. Mary Antoinette was one of them. And this figure here, Marat, was responsible in large part for, as I said, deciding which of the noble people lived, which of the noble people died, what would happen to their property. He had a really painful skin ailment. So as a result of that, he spent long days in the tub. And we see him here splayed out for us. I want us to think back to the image of Caravaggio that he painted of the entombment of Christ, where we had St. John and Nicodemus lowering Christ into the tomb, that bright light that was shown across Christ's body. We're really meant to see Marat here as um, somebody in the likeness of Christ, the way he's displayed. It's in a very noble way. Um, so he would spend this long periods of time in his bath. And what happened was a woman whose husband had been put to death at Marat's will uh, somehow got past the guards that were guarding his apartments and she came up and she stabbed him and he bled to death in his tub and we see his stab wound in his upper right hand corner of his chest and there he lays martyr for this French Revolution. I want to also point out here that David, the one who painted this painting, he's the one that did the Oath of the Horiati from two slides ago, the image we started with. So he was not only a painter of um, for the courts, he not only painted for King Louis XVI, but after King Louis uh, was overthrown, he became a very important painter in the revolution and was one of the people who actually voted to have the king and his wife killed. Simultaneously, in America, we had our American Revolution happening, and this is one of the big players um, of, of the American Revolution, someone whose legend comes down to us. And this is Paul Revere, who, of course, took the midnight ride from Concord to Boston to warn that the British is coming. He's seen posed here with his silversmithing tools. Um, that was his, his trade, his profession. So he's a teapot and different tools he's using to engrave this teapot. Neoclassicism gave way to Romanticism, and the two agreed on very little except for the idea of personal liberty and individuality. Romanticism celebrated the idea of imagination and emotion was far more important than reason. Eugene Delacroix was one of the leaders of Romanticism. He had spent some time in 1832, several months in North Africa, so had exposure to um, to different cultures, cultures off of the continent of Europe. He had been allowed to visit a harem, which was a rare privilege, and a lot of the imagery we see in his paintings comes from that experience. Uh, his work, if we look at this, this image, all the writhing bodies, this really brings us back to the Baroque and the sense of energy in the figures during the Baroque period and even into um, the Mannerist period of time. The iconography here, this king that we see laying on the bed, that's Serendophilus. He was a Syrian king who lived a very wasteful life. And we see him with his whole harem, so all the women and his, um, his guards and his slaves. And what is happening here, he was surrounded, his castle was surrounded. And rather than um, uh, volunteering to surrender, he is having everyone killed. So you see the women are being killed. Some of them are already in uh, dead, strewn across the bed. Those are that are locked in grasps with men, like on the right hand side. They are um, they're in the process of being slaughtered. His animals are slaughtered. You see the horse in the bottom left being killed. This is another one of Delacroix's pieces. We talked about this earlier in the semester. This is Liberty Leading the People. He painted this in 1830, and there was a little bit of rumblings of, of uh, there was a smaller French Revolution that was happening during the time, but it's really about that revolution that happened in the late 1700s. In the center, on the right hand, towards the right, we see Lady Liberty uh, trampling over the bodies of her enemies, leading uh, two, three, four feet high than the men surrounding her. This image, the women of Algiers, this comes directly from his time in North Africa. This is an image of three women uh, seated in a harem. So this was, these were the ladies of leisure, the whores of, of 
African king. And you see in front of them that they are smoking a hookah. Their shoes are off. They are just having uh, time to enjoy themselves. Artists that were realists sought to depict everyday life and or the ordinary, the, the everyday moments, rather than the heroic, historic, or erotic that we saw both romanticism and in neoclassicism. Gustave Courbert painted very large. This image that we're looking at is 16 feet by 21 feet. He won a medal with this at the Salon. And what the Salon was, was every year in, in France, they would have a very large exhibition of the current works. And if you were accepted to this, your piece was put on display and it was a great honor. It's considered uh, the most highest honor to be accepted to Salon. So this image was accepted to Salon. He took the gold medal. What we're looking at is an everyday scene. As we said in realism, the focus is on the everyday, not the extraordinary. So this is a um, an image of all the people of Ornans and specifically all the people that were visiting um, and paying respects during this burial. So we see this open pit grave in front of us and we have all the officials of the church here on the left hand side and then towards the right here we have the people like the mayor the judge we have mourners in the background we have the grave digger down here uh, standing uh, over the open hole and Additionally, Corbert, Gustave Corbert's friends and family were present in this, so they were shown also in the crowd here. When the painting was shown at Salon, admirers said that realism had produced its first masterpiece. And people that were opposed to realism, people that were still painting in the style of romanticism or interested in the romanticism, called it uh, a leader in the cult of ugly. People were offended by its unwillingness to beautify or sentimentalize this image, this, this moment of death. A museum critic at the Louvre said about Gustave Corbert's work that he painted people from the lower end of society, the lower end of the social scale, with seriousness, strength, and character usually reserved for gods, heroes, and kings. Your discussion board this week deals with Manet and his influence on Impressionism and his roots in realism. And looking at this piece uh, called The Luncheon on the Grass, we can see the grounding in realism. We talked about realism kind of cutting away the fluff. We have a naked woman, two, two gentlemen, and a woman in the background. It's a very real, everyday moment. We're not really sure about the subject matter here. What we do know is that Manet would have been very familiar with and would have modeled this image after this image here. This is Raphael, The Judgment of Paris from 1510, so several hundred years earlier. And another piece from that same period of time, this is Titian's piece, Fete Champre from 1510. So two naked women, two men, and then the last image, of course, has the, um, the layout, the format that he follows in his image here. This piece of art was rejected from Salon. We talked a few slides ago about how Salon was a sign of being a successful artist. So this image was rejected from Salon, as were many pieces. And they did a second Salon called the Salon de Refusis. So Salon pieces that were submitted that were rejected were shown in this second Salon. This piece was shown, and it was really thought to be quite garish. Possibly that he was trying to shock the public by showing an image like this. We hadn't really seen many naked women in art during this period of time. Looking at the form of this image here, we have that strong triangle grounding the center of the image. So here is that triangle for us. This woman in the front, this loose woman, obviously, because she's naked in the presence of men, um, she meets our gaze very strongly. We're not 
meant to look away from her. Maybe we're meant to feel a little embarrassed at seeing her naked. And then this woman in the background, if you think about scale and linear perspective, she should be quite a bit smaller how far away she is. She's just about as big as this, this rowboat that's over here that presumably all four of them fit in to get to the, uh, the shore of this, this water here. We all are so familiar with the term Impressionism as an art movement. It's one of the most popular styles of art, but I want to talk for a moment about the, the evolution or the birth of that name. This piece of art called Impression Sunrise by Claude Monet was painted in 1872, and a critic named Castanaghi used the title of this to explain what all of these artists, this group of new artists, had in common. They were not aiming for perfection, as in realism, to copy the details of a human form, but to capture an impression, an impression of a moment. They did not want to portray a landscape specifically, but this overall sensation of a landscape. The term Impressionism was really seen as derogatory initially. The, the group of work as a whole wasn't really accepted, coming out of neoclassicism, romanticism, realism, these very real and lifelike styles of art. What Impressionism was doing, what was so wonderful about Impressionism, was that these artists were no longer painting in a studio. With the invention of portable oil paints and the invention of watercolors, these artists were able to move outdoor and do something called plain air painting, or painting out outside of the studio. So there was no artificial light. And as a result, the, the colors and the, the softness of the works was very new. Artists were capturing shifting light. This specific piece he painted from a canoe in the background with the solid white of, of the village and notice that overall the color black is really banished from the canvas. The masters of this shifting light perspective is Renoir. This here, these are people at leisure activity. So a lot of Impressionism dealt with middle class people enjoying leisure activities. Earlier work, chiaroscuro, light and dark, that sharp contrast we see with shadows on the lower side of a body and sharp light coming on the upper side of a body. That was a studio produced uh, perspective. So having such a strong light source from one direction that really came from working in a studio. With working outside you have all this dappled light you see. You can really get a sense from the, this image that these people are underneath a shade, a canopy of trees, and that the breeze is moving the trees and the light is coming in through the, the leaves on the trees. This female painter, Bertha Morceau, would have had private art lessons. She was a young woman that was quite wealthy. And she practiced this plain air painting, open air painting, and was exhibiting in the salon successfully alongside the men. In 1874, she contributed nine paintings to the first Impressionist exhibit. The image we have here, again, middle class women, wealthy young ladies outside, dappled light coming across, the movement of the water. It's not a still moment. You get the you get the deep feeling of action happening. Gauguin here began as an Impressionist, but really became dissatisfied with the style of Impressionism. He felt he needed to find more substance of form that could be found in that optical perception of light. He wanted to find a deeper meaning, a spiritual meaning. He took a trip to the South Pacific, to Tahiti, to escape what he called the disease of civilization. And in his images, his new images, he created a flat palette, a flattening of form, broad colors, very primary colors, harmonious and exotic landscapes in the background. During his long stay in Tahiti, he would have had exposure to Egyptian art. And here we see a very Egyptian pose, the frontal shoulders, the, the legs turned to the side, really seeing the human form from its most recognizable shape. He really looked to this art of Africa, Egypt, and Islam and Asia uh, for guidance in his work. The woman herself, she's mysterious. We're not really meant to understand anything about her, and we're not meant to be embarrassed by her nudity either. Please click on the Smart History link for Saras, A Sunday on La Grande Jatte.
this post-impressionist period, these artists that were taking the work of impressionism and doing something very different with it was really led by Cezanne, whose work we see here. In contrast to Gauguin's need to travel to present exotic subject, Cezanne found everything he needed within walking distance of his home. He admired impressionists working from nature and approved of the palette that they used, their strokes of color, but was really dissatisfied with their emphasis on really casual composition and transitory light, the movement of light. What he felt made a great painting was a deep sense of structure and order. He had not, it really admired images such as the ashes of Pukan, that image of the woman in the foreground sweeping up the ashes of her deceased husband with the Roman city in the background. He made over 75 versions of this painting. This is Mount St. Victoria, which um, this specific image is from 1885, but he uh, will see shortly an image from 1902. Almost all of these images have that pyramid mountain in the background, geometry, hundreds of small patches of color, small vertical strokes, and let's look at his later version of the same image. So here you can see geometry has been applied, the shapes, the, the, the blending of color has been pretty much taken away. His grounding in Impressionism has started to fade away by this image, which is, as I said, 1902. Very structured lines echoed throughout. Van Gogh was also a post-Impressionist, but his specific style we called Expressionism, or he was an Expressionist. And those artists really used color to express oneself not to copy nature. So they weren't as concerned with articulating color uh, true to nature. This image, the starry night in the sky, he saw the, the heavens and all these stars were souls. He was really deeply moved and deeply affected by the idea of afterlife. He was a person that struggled with suicide for most of his life and really was not sure what the afterlife would bring and meditated deeply on this. The stars, the city, the cypress tree in the foreground, they're really all humming and undulating. And then in the, the, at the base, we have everything really grounded by the sleepy little town and the rolling hills leading up to the sky. Wheat field and cypress tree, again on the right-hand side, we have another cypress tree. Cypress trees are generally planted near graveyards. We don't know if that was significant and why he was always using them in his works. The sky here, again, really twisting, beautiful clouds, a sense of the wind sweeping through this open landscape. Bingham was an American artist, and most Americans viewed themselves as a continuation of European culture during this period of time. Painters would often go and train with great masters in Europe and learn to paint in Europe. We had no substitution in America for the ruins of the ancient worlds of Europe, the Gothic cathedrals, the Roman remains. Some Europeans, similarly, would come to America in order to experience this great land of opportunity, this open and barren landscape. Even though neoclassicism, romanticism, realism, impressionism, they were all broad trends that were happening in America, much of the work we saw is this very pastoral work or work really looking at the everyday moments. This image of the fur traders descend, defend, sorry, descending the Missouri River, um, we see a French trapper, this older gentleman on the, on the right-hand side with a fantastic mustache with his son on the left-hand side. They're going down, gliding down the Missouri River in a dugout canoe. The air is really heavy with the dawn light, and the sun is leaning over a cargo, presumably a bunch of pelts that they're bringing to trade. He cradles a rifle in his arm. Looks like he had just shot a duck. You can see the duck across, leaning across the car, cargo. The father's a little more cautious and watchful, and they're really making eye contact with us, the viewer. Mary Cassatt was an American who went to Paris to to paint, to learn to paint, to work. She exhibited in the salons in the 1870s. This image is very uh, grounded in Impressionism, the idea of uh, shifting lights, 
but she was really familiar with Japanese art and Japanese printmaking. There had been an exhibition that had traveled to Europe. And so a lot of these bold blocks of color that we see, we attribute to that. I hope all is well with everyone. Next week we'll be talking about the art of Asia, Africa, Islam, and the Americas. Yeah.